Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Uh, tonight what we wanted to talk about, we, we've been going back and forth, uh, some herbal medicine stuff, some Dead Sea Scrolls stuff, uh, prophecy stuff. Actually, they're all related to Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but I wanted to look at um, the seven heads of the dragon in Revelation. And there's a lot of speculation on what it might mean. And I think it'll be interesting just to kind of come back and, and see from some of the studies we've done. And again, what I'm trying to do is create um, really good charts or graphics or whatever to show the point. And so let me go ahead and start by um, pulling up the text we're going to look at. So this is Revelation 17. And this is the one that talks about the great beast and that... Um, the the harlot that sits on the beast now we've talked about that a little bit the harlot is a false religious system that looks christian or looks godly but it's not and so um um what this says here is that he's seeing this beast or this dragon and the woman that sits on it is this um false religious system the beast is a, a series of empires that carries the same concept of false religious system. Now, when we look at uh, the book of Gad the Seer, it gives us an indication that there are two anti-Semitic powers, one headquartered in Rome, Italy, one headquartered in Saudi Arabia, which would be Islam and Roman Catholicism, that are not the harlot system, they're just anti-Semitic powers but somehow they come together or factions of them come together to create this end time religion. And we see that beginning already anyway. We see that with um, this Chrislam concept. And I don't know exactly how that will manifest, but something will happen eventually. But now the heads on the beasts, I think, are interesting. So let's go ahead and read. This is Revelation 17.1. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come up hither, or come hither, and I will show you uh, the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. And so, again, in, in the symbolism, a prostitute is a false religious system, uh, usually referred to as Babylon, if it's the end time one. And we saw that in the prophecy of Zechariah. I think it's five, the uh, the Shinar Babylon, Babylonian mystery religion with the two stork women. So same kind of a setup. Now, when something comes out of waters or, or is sitting on many waters, that generally means Gentile nations like many of them. Not necessarily every one, but a power of some sort. If it's talking about land, it's usually referring to the land of Israel. So it's symbolic of either talking about Jews in the Jewish land or Gentiles. So this is the great uh, prostitute that's sitting on many waters. So this false religious system is, is in many countries with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And again, that's all symbolic of a false religious system. Instead of a loyal wife, it's a prostitute. Therefore, it's false. You should be, a, the religion should be dedicated to the one true God. And if it's dedicated to a false God, it's like having an affair. The symbolism anyway. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the inhabitants of the earth are either threatened or bribed or something. Drunkenness usually means bribery. So uh, here, take this. You can have all the wine you want. It's a party. Only just give me what I want, whatever that is. And so this is a false religious system. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. So a red dragon like creature full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now we know from Daniel um, chapter two and chapter seven that the end time empire is split up into 10 kings. So in this case, uh, we're talking about, it has seven heads uh, and those represent empires we'll see in a minute. 
And on one of those heads, there are 10 horns. That corresponds to Daniel's image in chapter 2 with the 10 toes. And in chapter 7 with the uh, 10 horns on the nondescript beast, which also corresponds with uh, the Ezra apocalypse with the three-headed eagle. And so you have this... Um, this concept. So remember in Daniel's prophecy, originally there are 10 kings that come together to reformat the empire and it doesn't work because they can't agree. So the Antichrist comes along and tries to take it over. He'd be like an 11th, so to speak, but three of them rebel. So he destroys three of these countries and that leaves seven and he's the eighth one that joins it. So at one point we see seven um or ten ten horns with ten crowns one on each crown and another point we see ten horns with seven crowns so that lets you know that one's in the first half of the tribulation one's in the second half of the tribulation so in this case we're talking about how it starts so there's um scarlet colored beasts with names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Now, the blasphemy might be a clue, too, but we'll skip that for now. So, seven heads and ten horns on one of the heads. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Now, back in, in Jeremiah and other of the prophets, they talk about Babylon being a golden cup in the Lord's hand. So Babylon used to be godly, or it looked godly, and then became something else. Okay, so on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth. Now, this is an interesting thing to think about. If she's the mother, she's kind of the one that starts it or the largest one of it. But the mother of something is things that spawn from it. So if a country, um, you could say like England is the mother of many countries like Canada, United States, etc. And so this is a religious system that has spawned daughters that are kind of like her but slightly different. This woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And of course, admiration doesn't mean like he thought she was cool. It was just a wonder, something that you can't wrap your head around. So in this case, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus would be killing of Christians. And so in contrast with that, it's the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That would be Jews and Christians. So <clears throat> the angel said, why do you marvel? So he's seeing the sight. He can't figure out what it is. He's just, wow. The angel says, why do you marvel? Let me pull this up here. And I will show you the mystery or tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And we'll come back later and look more detailed at the woman but the beast tonight is what we want to look at the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition uh, perdition means basically destruction or hell a human being would die and go to hell um, a nation would perish and never come back but somehow this beast was and currently is not but it comes out of the pit and goes to perdition. So right now we're looking at this, the, the empire that's ruling uh, the known world, specifically Israel, is the Roman Empire. So the beast itself that he's focusing on was and is not Rome, but it will be again. So it's something like that. Um, let's see here. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So the people that aren't saved, that don't have a love for a truth, are wondering at this, following it. People that understand would not. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. 
So this is basically saying that the empire is not Rome as we as they knew it at that point. Many, many years down the line, it's going to be a different kind of Roman Empire. Here is the mind that has wisdom. So here's a riddle for you. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And I want you to pay attention to this. First nine and ten go together. And there are seven kings. So this is a prophecy that has a dual fulfillment. In this vision that he's seeing, this, this beast that has the seven heads, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, there's been a lot of places that have said, been said to be built on seven mountains. Um, Rome, Jerusalem, um, several other places. Actually, there's quite a few. But if we go all the way down to the bottom, it talks about this, this woman is currently ruling over the nations of the earth. So that would make it Rome, and Rome is built on seven hills. So this is talking about Rome. So in one sense, it's Rome we're talking about. In another sense, though, uh, there are seven kings. Now, when we see kings, you got to figure out if it's talking about a king, like um, father, son, grandson, great-grandson, all one dynasty. Or are we talking about different dynasties, different kings or different kingdoms, maybe all ruling at the same time because there are seven different places. So a king, and usually it's translated king, usually we're talking about kingdoms or empires. When we go back and we look at, at um, Noah's Testament and we look at uh, Daniel, we see the concept of metal empires. And we'll, we'll look at that again just to kind of remind you. But I just wanted to look at this first, and then we'll have some pictures to show you, some drawings. So, um, so there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. But when he comes, he must continue a short space. So most of us have understood that this means that there are five previous empires. And the one that is, is Rome. So Rome is an empire currently ruling over everyone when John had this vision. And the other is not yet come. It's sometime in the future from 2,000 years ago. So it says, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes to perdition. So a son of perdition or a son of damnation is uh, someone who is cursed that fights against the Lord's uh, what the Lord wants to do, fights against the Lord, period. Uh, Judas Iscariot was called a son of perdition. The Antichrist is called a son of perdition. So it's this kind of stuff. In other words, a son of destruction. He wants to destroy what God wants, and God will end up destroying him. So the beast that you saw was and is not even he is the eighth. So we're talking about the Antichrist, the Antichrist kingdom, or, or nation, then the one nation that he rules. Um, and then he comes into the ten, destroys three of the seven, and is the eighth. So this part here is talking about that. And then the, the heads are a little different. So we have a beast. We've got a woman sitting on it, but for now we'll just put her aside. We have a beast that is the satanic kingdom that's always been fighting against God's people and, and the Messiah. And it branches off into seven heads, and they each have pieces to them. And one of the heads, the one, the seventh one, all the way toward the end, has these ten horns. And then ten horns make up this last kingdom, which the ten toes and the ten horns of all the other prophecies. So just read Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 for those. Uh, Noah's Testament for the other metal kingdoms. And we're going to look at some pictures here in a minute. So the 10 horns that you saw were 10 kings. Again, could be a king king, but most likely a king of a nation. So in this case, the horns we know represents 10 specific nations or kings, people that rule over a nation or a group or something like that. So the empires are the heads and this last empire is made up of 10 kings or 10 nations. 
that have received no kingdom as of yet, but will receive power as kings one hour with the beast, such a short time. These have one mind and give their power and strength to the beast. He will make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. So ultimately the Messiah comes back, second coming, and destroys all these people. For he is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. And then he explains it here. You saw the waters. The beast comes up out of the waters. The waters that you saw where the horse sits are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So just Gentile nations. And what, if you take this and go back to chapters, Revelation chapters 12 and 13, you'll see the dragon again, the sea beast, and the land beast. Land beast would be something going on in Israel. Sea beast, something going on in the rest of the world, the Gentile world. Um, let's see here. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, make her desolate, burn her flesh, and eat her with fire, burn her with fire. Because God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now, the woman that you saw is that great city which currently rules or is ruling over the kings of the earth. So he's identifying the great city as Rome. So the empire, one of the heads, is Rome. The head that comes later has the ten horns. So kind of confusing, but it actually gives us a lot of details to go through. So let me stop there, and I want to go back to... Um, just to kind of talk about some of this stuff. Um, so you exit out of that. So this is our Bible Facts website, biblefacts.org. And if you go down to resources, we have photos, PDFs and other stuff, and prophecy charts. So in here, we've seen these before, and we'll kind of go back over them, and then I want to share something else with you. This first one, and you can download these and print them out. Hopefully they're good quality, uh, because I'm working on a book, and I'm <laughs> taking the the book printing to PDF, so it'll have the right thing and saving it as a JPEG. So um, maybe not the absolute best quality. But here is um, the Metal Empires of Daniel. This is chapter two. So real briefly, he sees a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, brass meaning copper, copper alloy, legs of uh, iron, and then feet of clay and toes of iron mixed with clay. So we look at this, and this isn't done completely, but this is just something that we're, we're seeing. It represents the Babylonian Empire, the Medio Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, and then the one that hasn't come yet. And we've talked about this a little bit too, but the interesting thing about it is, so we're here in Rome and it says five have fallen one is, the is is Rome, and the other one, this one here, has not come yet. So that's still true in our time period, except now Rome is in the past, kind of, kind of. So if Rome is the sixth one, the last one is the seventh, and before the sixth one there are five, this is obviously one, two, and three. Where are the other two? And so those will kind of help us to understand this. So when we look at this, this is really interesting. We see the, the per, it's called the Persian Empire, but it's actually a coalition of Medes and Persians. So it's a dual empire. In this case, Greece is called just Greece, like one. And it starts out as one under Alexander the Great. But then it breaks up into four pieces. The four pieces um, take their own kingdoms. Uh, Greece and Thrace, which is like Turkey and Greece, have nothing to do with Israel, so they're out of the picture. So the next thing that you want to see is the two that do have something with Israel, Syria and Egypt. So again, we're looking at this. Rome splits into two kingdoms, east and west, so Rome and Byzantium. And so if this kingdom has two pieces, it's Rome, but it's Rome and Byzantium. And this one is Greece, but it, it's not just Greece per se. It's actually Syria and Egypt. And this is the Persian Empire, which is not just Persia, but it's 
Persia, and Medes, the Median Empire. And this is Babylon, of which we'll see in a little bit is actually Assyria and Babylon. So all of these things are coming in twos. So that gives us a clue, uh, and, and you can kind of maybe think of this, since Rome did split into two pieces, and there's two feet with toes, we're not told that the statue was deformed, like six toes are over here and four over here or anything like that. That would be something really interesting to look at, because it would be telling you how many are in each category. But since it doesn't say anything, we're going to assume it looked normal. A normal human has five toes on each foot. So if that's the case, we get the idea if this is Rome and this is the Byzantine or Eastern and Western Rome, we've got five kingdoms that might come out of Rome or Europe and five kingdoms that might come out of the Middle East or something like that. Uh, we'd have to go back and look and see all of the, uh, um, the area that Rome, the Roman Empire had at its fullest. I mean, all through the ages, and that, that would take some time. And then the Byz Byzantine Empire at its fullest, or maybe as it grows and shrinks, it takes different pieces. So outline the entire thing. And uh, somewhere in that should be five here and five here. So, but let's go back a little further then. So these are 10 nations, possibly Europe and in, in however it forms, there's two pieces to it. And this is Rome, east and west, Greece, north and south, Medio Persia, which uh, Medes and Persians, and this one is Babylon, which is Babylon and Assyria. So let me exit out of this, and we'll go into some of these others. Now, here is from the Testament of Noah. And in his testament, he has this dream that there is this special olive tree, and olive tree represents Israel. This is the nation that will form, and the Messiah's first coming, the Messiah will come through them. And so it, as it's forming, also these other trees are forming. And these trees are just Gentile nations. So this is like the sea, and this is like the land, the beasts. So all of this is going on. Sometimes trees fight against each other, and sometimes they just sit there. So there's small wars between nations and stuff like that, and that's one thing. But then these mountains of metal uh, appear, and these are empires. An empire doesn't want to just take over, like, France fighting Spain, okay, that kind of stuff. One of these guys would want to take over France and Spain and Portugal and Italy and just keep going, eventually take over the whole world if possible, but as, as much as it can. That's an empire um, attitude. So the first one in his dream is lead and then clay. And then we have gold, silver, copper, and iron. And then we have lead and clay. So that's eight. And so, like, it's talking about there are seven basic heads uh, out of which this empire, these empires come. And with the Antichrist, it's actually even an eighth. So it's really interesting to see this. Now, I asked a question a minute ago about if Rome is the one that is, five have fallen, one is, the other's not yet come. So if Rome is ruling at this point, and it's iron, iron legs and Daniel, before that is copper, which is Greece, which is and silver, which is the Medio Persian, and then gold, which is Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. So looking at it like this, if this is the sixth and these are the three, we go back and try to find the other two. And so that's what's interesting. So in Noah's dream, he sees all of them. These two are so old that even in Jacob's time, um, or in Daniel's time, they're old enough to not be relevant anymore. The only reason why these are relevant for us is because it tells us the pattern, and we're focusing still on the iron piece of Rome, and eventually the clay that comes out of it, the iron mixed with clay this time around. So when you identify the nations, or not the nations, but the empires, that should help you figure out what you're looking for, or what you're looking at. So this is from Noah's Testament. So this is Daniel chapter 2, and this is from Noah's Testament. And then we, a ways back, looked at this one. This is Zechariah's lead kingdom. Now, let me actually back up for a second. So if we have 
um, and we identify these. This is actually Nimrod's empire, the first empire of the world. Um, and then it fell, tried to destroy everything. Uh, Abraham rose up, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, actually, and destroyed Nimrod and his kingdom. And then later on, they went into Egypt. So Nimrod's kingdom is here. Egypt's kingdom is here. And then Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, uh, Medio persia Greece, Rome. And then this is another Babylon type thing, which is a mystery Babylon, different kind of a thing. And then this clay, later on, we find out it's iron mixed with clay, is that last kingdom. So it's interesting to kind of see that. But going back then, we have this mystery Babylon, which is lead, which is connected with this lead. And that lead is um, going back to Shinar or Babylon, Nimrod, way, way back. So when we look at this, we look at Zechariah 5. And you could actually say this is all past, except the Dead Sea Scrolls would tell you that if a prophet wrote something that's just for his time period, has no bearing at all on end time prophecy, then it was not put in the canon because it's not for us. It's not relevant. So everything in the canon has something to do with end time prophecy. So when we look at this, we see it's the woman in the basket. The woman is called wickedness, which is like a prostitute, which would be a false religious system. She's taken to the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, actually the old name. So that makes you think of Nimrod's Babylon. And the thing is, she's put in this basket, a bushel basket, and you can see the prostitute peeking out right here. And this is sealed with a lead seal. So it's interesting that the metal kingdoms, the lead, Babylon, this is Shinar, prostitute, lead. So it's all the same thing, just older terms. So this, she's sealed in this basket, sealed away with lead and taken somewhere in Shinar, which is Babylon. It doesn't necessarily mean it starts in Babylon, but it's the identification. Uh, so the Antichrist, you know, for instance, uh, is pictured as the ruler of each one of these groups that they were having problems with. So the Antichrist is, is pictured as the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Syrian, the Egyptian, the Tyrrhenian, uh, stuff like that. So it doesn't mean he's going to come from any one of those, but the, the despots, the dictators that were back then at that time, and the situations tell us something about end time prophecy. So she's taken to Shinar. So she's the Shinar mystery religion, Babylonian harlot, uh, or the Shinar harlot, so to speak. Wicked woman. The word for wickedness can mean wickedness in any way, like murder. But most of the time, it's especially if it has something to do with a woman, it's got something to do with prostitution, which is a false religious system. So she's put in a house, which can be translated temple. So she has a temple or a religious order keeping her kind of there or alive until she's ready to come out in the end times. So this is a picture of end time prophecy. And the interesting thing about it is she's protected and taken there by these two stork women. So there are two anti-Semitic world powers, uh, religious powers, that protect her or come together eventually to create this. So that's the symbol. And I, in this particular thing, you can see here, I put in the symbol for Gad, because uh, Gad has the same story about end time prophecy but refers to it as a donkey and a camel. So it's it's nice to have the same story with different pictures so that you know the pictures aren't important, but the story is. So storks, this is these are stork-winged women just because storks are evil or unclean rather. So these look like some look like angels kind of, you know, angelic women, but they're black stork wings, so they're unclean angels. That should give you the idea they're demonic. So it's something spiritual, trying to look like an angel, but it's not. Same thing as the camel and the donkey. They're both unclean animals and they represent that. So this all is talking about the same thing. So this is what I want to show you tonight. With this background, looking at Revelation 17 that we just looked at. And we'll go over this again and again. So it's not, 
it, it takes a while to get it in your head. I'm still trying to put it together. But this is something I've been working on the graphics for a bit. And let's see if I can make it. Okay, I guess that's good enough. It's a little blurry there. But anyway, these, it's a, again, we'll be in a book. But these are the heads of the dragon. And we have the traditional Babylon, Egypt, Babylon again, Medio Persia, Greece, Rome, and then this 10 nation empire. So in the scriptures, we have this is the 10 nation empire with the 10 horns. This is Rome, the one that is currently ruling. And then before that was Greece, Medio Persia, and then Nimrod's. Wait, Nimrod? No. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon with Daniel. So those are the three, but there were five that had fallen. One is, and the other's not yet come. So the interesting thing about that is you go back and look at Egypt and then Babylon again, and you look at this and say, well, why are there two Babylons? And then this mystery Babylon comes along later, so that's a third one. So that kind of seems like it breaks the pattern. But what I wanted to share with you is that it's an interesting story. So when you go back and you look at the early post-flood records, uh, Jewish records going back, and we actually do have a good amount of information from the, there actually are historical records from the pre-flood era, or people really early post-flood that wrote about pre-flood stuff. Um, anyway, so this first one is Babylon. We think about the Tower of Babel with Nimrod. But in reality, let me see if I can bump this up just a little bit here. That's a little better. So in here, we can see it's Canaan and Shinar. Okay. So in other words, in the prophecies, and we see this as part of Nimrod's, I mean, uh, Noah's Testament. And we see it in scripture too. Remember, Canaan left Egypt. He was a Hamite, traveled up the side of the coast of Shem's territory and founded uh, Zidon. Then came down later, his descendants did, and founded Tyre. And they became the Canaanites. Well, on the other side, that's that's west, but on the east, Nimrod came up and decide, decided to attack some of the Hamites, or excuse me, Japhethites, and start a war with them, kind of a skirmish. And then eventually they came together to form what we consider the Babylonian, first Babylonian empire. Nimrod was the one ruling it, but the Canaanites were in together. So it was actually to attack from both sides. So that's the ancient history for it. So even though this is the first one, which is the Babylonian empire, is actually Canaan and Shinar. And this is an interesting pattern to kind of show. So if the first head of the dragon was the, the very first Babylonian empire, which consisted of Canaan and Shinar, then we go to the next one and we see that's Egypt. And there's a lot of history about upper and lower Egypt. And Moses dealt with both uh, King Kikuanus and the Pharaoh that became the very first, or the king of Egypt that became the very first Pharaoh. So all that history is there. So you basically have upper and lower Egypt. So two pieces. This is east and west. This would be north and south, but two, two pieces nonetheless. <clears throat> then we get to Babylon. The ten, ten tribes were taken by Assyria, and then the the two tribes were taken by Babylon, Nimrod, or Nebuchadnezzar, rather, sorry. So this represents Assyria and Babylon, okay? So again, it's an interesting pattern showing this. And then we have the Medo-Persian Empire. There's enough right there in Scripture to let you know it's two. The Persians were the strongest, so it can be considered the Persian Empire, but it's still Medes and Persians. So then we come up to this next one, Greece, and again, we see the whole concept of there being one Greece, it splits into four, two of which have nothing to do with Israel. So that leaves the two, Syria and Egypt, another north and south. And Egypt's tossed back and forth between these two. So, and then we have Rome, which at the time of Israel is simply one nation, but as prophesied, it breaks into two, Rome and Byzantium. So this one here. So all that to kind of show you when the Ten Nation Empire comes, it would be a Western and an Eastern or a North and a South or something like that. 
but basically since it's coming out of what was rome it's partially rome and partially byzantium so this can help us identify potentially the eastern and western horns uh, of this empire so when the empire reforms again and in in that particular form it'll be that so that's what we're wanting to kind of show you here one side note that I, I forgot to mention, but I was in this very first one with all the history of Nimrod and Abraham and those things that are going on. The interesting thing about it is, is that they come together, um, the two sides and create, it starts as two, Canaan and, and Nimrod, but it comes together to form one. Then we have the Tower of Babel incident and they're broken up into the 70 principal languages. So the empire is shattered into 70 pieces. Well, very quickly, there's, there's other ancient texts about kings putting together translation schools and to get so they can communicate and try to rebuild the empire. And you see that it begins to form back, but it never really forms back to the one empire. It forms into four. And we see this in chapter four, I think it's 14 of Genesis, where you got Amraphel, which is Nimrod's other name ruling Babylon or Shinar. Then you got Ariak, Ketoliomer, and the other guy, Tidal, king of the Goyim. So it, it one nation fragments into 70, pulls back together in four. But the same pattern is because Ariak and uh, Tidal were actually decent people, and they had no problem with Abraham, didn't want to have a problem with Abraham. So they're out of the picture. So that only leaves two which is um, Kedoliomer and Nimrod. So again, it's really interesting to kind of see this. So in a sense, this one was a four kingdom going to two, and Greece was a four kingdom going to... It was one kingdom, ended up four, went to two. This one is one kingdom, went to, went to 70, pulled back to four, and went to two. So who knows what would have happened with these others. Maybe they did the same or not, but we don't know that much about it. But I wanted to share this to you, this particular um, picture here. So it's an interesting thing. It's something you don't really see. I've seen pictures of, um, like I love Clarence Larkin's work, but Clarence Larkin did something like, um, um, I think he had a seven-headed dragon and the, t the 10 horns, or he had the crowns on different heads. And it kind of sounds like it might be that, but that's why you got to pull together the entire picture. So anyway, so there's lots of stuff like that. We're still trying to pull it together, but this is how it would be interpreted if we believe the Dead Sea Scrolls. So putting Noah's Testament with Gad the Seer, uh, with the Ezra Apocalypse, with Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Revelation 17, and Revelation 12 and Revelation 13. So pulling those together. And I think it's wise that we keep those separate so that we can know this is all Bible and this is extra biblical. Because the extra biblical stuff, um, I'm fairly convinced it's legitimate. But even if it's legitimate, it doesn't mean it's translated right. Um, and even if I trans the, my version was translated perfectly, which yeah, um, that still doesn't mean that what I started with was correct. I mean, if it's a translation of a translation of a translation, and then I got a hold of it, did it there, you know, you got to be careful of that stuff, but the basic stories are there. And if the stories are all the same, like for instance, the story about the Nimrod and Canaan and stuff, that's, in the Talmud, it's in the book of Jasher, it's in two or three other places too. Josephus, Josephus will mention that. Josephus will mention the two, the upper and lower Egypt. Josephus and Jasher, I think, both do that. So we still have all this kind of patterns. Anyway, you're welcome to download that, print it out or whatever. But we're got, this is the kind of thing I'm wanting to do. Again, like Clarence Larkin made his book on dispensational truth. And he would start off with some diagram or chart or something like this and then have three, four, six, ten pages, however long it takes to explain this. And then the next chapter would start with a big picture, basically a picture book. 
And when, when we get to prophecy, that's kind of what we need. If you read the story, the interpretation once, think about it, then all you need is this picture. So, and I think that'll go a lot further. So we're continuing to work in this and we're going to keep, keep working on it. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight.